Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. howdy! All right. Hey, it's great to see you all again for a second week in a row. Uh, I hope that all is well, and I just always consider it such a joy to get to come and to be here with you at, uh, at FaithBridge. I want to start today by filling you in on Timothy Atik 2.0, or people call me TA, so we'll just go with TA 2.0. And in order for me to fill you in on TA 2.0, I need to do my best at trying to give you a picture of what I looked like when I was a freshman in college, all right? And so uh, I don't have one picture just that beautifully encapsulates it, and so I'll walk you through a few pictures just so you can kind of get, get a sense of what I had going on for me my freshman year at Texas A&M University. Let's start at the top, and we'll start with the hair. So if you will, go ahead and put up the first pic. This is, a, this, is a, this is my high school senior picture, but it is showing you the haircut that I rocked for the first 20 years of my life. It was a beautiful, sharp comb over um, that took a lot of hairspray, a blow dryer, and a solid brush. Uh, that was the hairstyle that I had for the first 20 years of my life. Uh, when I wasn't um, sporting that style, I was wearing a hat. And so if you go to the next picture, it's going to give you kind of a more full body shot uh, of what I had going on. So I might have been wearing the latest and greatest Abercrombie and Fitch hat. And then if I was dressing it up, I'd have an Abercrombie and Fitch sweater. This is by no way an endorsement of Abercrombie and Fitch, all right? But just back in 1999, 2000, this is what I had going on. And uh, working your way on down, when it came to jeans, it was a very specific type of jean. It was one that was baggy yet tapered, all right? That was an important combination, that it was baggy, yet tapered, and then to finish it all off, I wore hiking boots every single day, because, you know, scout motto, be prepared. You never know on the campus of A&M when you're going to need to, like, step up on a curb or something like that, so that was always helpful to have that uh, going on. So that was TA 1.0. And uh, everything was going great until I stepped into my sophomore year of college at A&M, and I met a girl. And uh, as we started dating, we got about two weeks into our relationship, and then the girl began to have serious doubts about our relationship, and she began questioning whether she wanted to be dating me simply because of how I looked. Uh, I knew that was the case because she told me, and so... Um, <laughs> When I found that out, you know what I did? I'll tell you what I did. I marched right over to her dorm, and we got in the car and drove to the Houston Galleria for her to change everything about me. <laughs> so she, uh, she had me get a, a haircut, and uh, that was the day that my hair went from being on my forehead to being in the air, and uh, I began a lifelong relationship with hair product. Um, and then she, uh, she took me to a store to get new jeans. It was no longer the baggy and tapered, light wash. It was more of a darker look. It was boot cut at the time. And then I got a new shirt. This is the shirt that I got. I got something like this. It's like a baseball looking shirt. I don't even know that that was cool then, but that's what I had going for me, and then the hiking boots were out. Those were no longer allowed on my feet, and so I stepped into a pair of male clogs. <laughs> and as I look at those, that's the exact, I mean, that was what I wore. It's kind of the tuxedo version of Crocs is what I had going on on my feet. Um, I also, to this day, never wear hats because she told me that I don't look good in hats, and so the the hat days are over. You might be sitting there asking, why did you stay in this relationship? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> to be clear, it was not my wife. I probably should, should share that. So that's how we have TA 2.0 
today. Now, the reason that I tell you that is because I want you to see what was at play in the relationship. Um, I, in a sense, became who this girl needed me to be in order for me to be enough for her. See, I began to question if I was enough for her, and the reason that I was questioning if I was enough for her was definitely because she was questioning if I was enough for her. And so eventually, I just simply became who she needed me to be in order for me to be enough for her. And the reason that I tell you that is because last week and this week, we are talking about this idea of our enoughness. I believe that every single person here knows what it feels like to not feel like you are enough for someone. We know what it feels like to not be enough for a parent or for an ex-spouse or for a current spouse. We know what it feels like to not be enough for a former boss or a current boss or for a job that you applied for and really wanted, but they said no. We know what it feels like to not be enough for a group of people that you want to be connected to, but they do not want that type of connection. Last week and this week, we are identifying key forces at play in our lives that really deal with our enoughness. And so last week, we talked about the the force of comparison. And if you weren't here because you were on spring break, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that message because um, comparison is the thief of joy. And the reality is you might be getting robbed. This week, we're going to talk about the force of conformity. Conformity is the idea of becoming who someone else needs you to be in order for you to be enough. I'll say that one more time. At least in terms of today, I am defining conformity as becoming who someone else needs you to be in order for you to be enough. I wonder if you've ever conformed. I wonder if you've ever changed the way you look or the way you dress. I wonder if you've ever changed the way you talk around certain groups of people. I wonder if you've ever altered your personality or your convictions or your boundaries. I believe that we all know what it feels like and what it is like to become who someone else needs us to be in order for us to be enough. We want to get to a place where we fight for our joy and say, enough with being enough. And it comes today with us reaching a place where we can simply say, enough with conformity. So if you want to fight for your joy today, then I want to invite you to join me in Genesis 27. That's where we're going to start. We're going to bounce all over the scriptures today, but we're going to start in Genesis 27. And here's my goal. My goal today is to give you three important realities you need to know regarding conformity. The first key reality you need to know regarding conformity is this. Conformity feeds on a need for approval. Conformity feeds on a need for approval. That is what um, conformity is hungry for. A need for someone else's acceptance and approval is what nourishes conformity and causes it to grow in our lives. It's what intensifies a craving inside of us to become who someone else needs us to be in order for us to be enough. I think a great example of this in the scriptures is the person of Jacob that we find in the book of Genesis. Jacob is one of the key figures in the book. Uh, Jacob has an older brother named Esau. Jacob's parents' names are Isaac and Rebekah. What you need to know is in the ancient Near East, the oldest son was entitled to a double portion of inheritance and the right to rule the family when his father had passed away. That means that Esau, Jacob's older brother, should have been the one to receive that blessing. But God comes to the father, Isaac, and says, we're going to do things different in your family. In your family, the younger is the one who's going to be blessed. And that's a problem for the dad, Isaac, because he loves his older son, Esau, more than he loves his younger son, Jacob. And we know that because of what Genesis 25 tells us. It tells us this. In verse 28, it says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah, the mom, loved 
Jacob. So just to kind of fill you in on what's going on here, the dad Isaac loves Esau, the older son, because his older son is kind of a guy's guy. He's a man's man. He's a hunter. So he spends a lot of time in a deer stand. He wears Carhartt every day. And the text is very specific. He's a hairy individual. He's a hairy man. He's got one of those thick beards that you just can't take your eye off of. Like, man, that thing is incredible. And he's, he's just got it going on. On the other hand, Jacob, the younger son, is different. He's more of a mama's boy. And the text talks about his hair, and it says that he is a smooth man. Now, I don't think that's saying, dude, that guy is smooth, like he's cool. No, this might be the first reference we have to manscaping in the history of mankind. It says he is a smooth man. For some reason, those two things are distinguishing characteristics of Jacob and Esau. One has a lot of hair and the other doesn't. Isaac, the dad, gets old in age. He realizes that his end date in life is coming. And so he attempts to go around the will of God and he aims to bless his older son Esau. Well, Rebecca, the mom, knows about this and she wants to ensure that Jacob, the younger son, the one whom she loves, actually gets the blessing. Isaac, the dad, is blind. Okay, his eyesight does not work. And so what the mom does is she, she puts animal skins on Jacob and sends Jacob in in hopes that he will receive the blessing that the dad wanted to give to Esau, the older son. And we pick it up. In verse 18, watch what happens. Verse 18 of Genesis 27, it says this. So he, that's Jacob, went into his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that, you, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, are you really my son? He answered him, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. So do you see what's going on here? Jacob takes on the image of Esau in order to receive a blessing from his father. Do you see it? Jacob becomes who his father needs him to be in order for him to be enough for his blessing. And I read that and I can't help but ask two questions that I think every single person in this room needs to ask. Here's the first one. Number one, whose blessing in this world do you want or need? The second question is, who are you having to become in order to get their blessing? Two questions, very important questions, clarifying questions when it comes to conformity in your own life. Whose blessing in this world do you want or need, and who are you having to become in order to get their blessing? Let's just talk about the idea of parents. Many of you are parents, but while you are parents, you also have parents. And it's amazing, it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, Something in you can go all of your life longing to know that you are enough for your parents. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there's people in their 40s or 50s who long to know that they are successful in the eyes of their parents. And so that, that determines how you work and where you work. You might even be fulfilling a role at a job that you don't even like, but you know what it does? It gives you money, it gives you success, and the hope is that your mom or dad will see it and declare that you are significant and you are, you are successful. I believe that mom guilt is a real thing. It is a real thing that eats away at the souls of moms. 
And what happens is, is, is many of you get online and you read these blogs written by other moms and, and they're living these lives that might be realistic for them, but it's unrealistic for the majority of moms in the world. And so they, they portray this, this life that seems like the ideal life for a mom or you look out into the, into the community and you see different moms that just seem to be doing every single thing right. And so what you do is you begin to try and conform your life to the ideal in hopes that you will be enough for who? I don't know. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's just the, the general public that, that people would look at you as you look at other moms. Maybe it's you want to just know that you're enough for yourself, that if, if you do enough, you would be able to look yourself in the mirror and say, you are enough. I don't know what it's like for you at, at work. Maybe when you travel, you kind of become a different person. There's like travel you, and then there's home you. And it's possible when you're away from home and you get around other coworkers, man, maybe you compromise your convictions. You, you transgress boundaries. Because heaven forbid you stand up for what is actually right. What about when we come into this place? Anyone just playing the Christian game this morning? You don't have to raise your hand. But isn't it crazy? Don't we have our best fights with our spouses on the way to church? I mean, you can fight with your spouse and it's like you're getting out of the car like, I cannot believe you. Hey, how are you doing today? God is good. Yes, he is. Just can't wait to get in there and worship. He's faithful. You get back into the car. I am not speaking to you. You are a bonehead. You drive me crazy. Isn't that crazy? We just, we can, we can form. We play the Christian game. We know the right lingo. We use phrases like intentionality and community. And, and we talk about God's goodness and, and faithfulness, and we can come in here and we can raise our hands and we can assume all different positions. All the while, different things are going on in our mind and we're just playing the game. We're, we're becoming who everyone in this room needs us to be because we are at church. You know what life just becomes? It just becomes one big performance, one big audition. I've used this example multiple times, but your life just becomes an unending season of the voice where you have this hand-picked panel of judges in your life. You need someone to press their buzzer, flip their turner, turner, turn their chair around to declare, hey, you're enough for me. You are enough. See, the first reality you need to know is that conformity feeds on a need for approval. Second reality you need to know about conformity is this conformity allows someone who isn't God to play God in your life. Conformity allows someone who isn't God to play God in your life. Look at what Psalm 139 verses 13 through 16 say. David says this, for you formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eye saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me when as yet there was None of them. Do you know what David is saying? David is saying that God gets credit for you. You are a product of God's limitless creativity, power, and goodness. God is incapable of crafting a mediocre existence. You are a product of all of those things. God gets credit for you. Now, David's wording was very important, and I hope you don't miss it. I hope you saw it in verse 16 when he said, In your book were written every one of them the days that were formed for me. See, David could have used the phrase, In my book were written all the days that you formed 
for me. He could have said, in my book, giving kind of this picture that God has written a book for each individual in this room, and he's numbered the pages of your book, and he knows how the story of your life in your book is going to play out. But that's not what David says. David says, in your book were written all of the days that were formed for me. What David is trying to do is he's trying to tell us God has written the book of all of creation. And what he has done in his kindness is God has written each one of us into the story of his book of creation. In his kindness, God has put us into his story, into his book, not our book. Now, I'm not an author. I'm just making an assumption here. But I think I'm right to say that authors write characters into their stories because they have a specific purpose for that character to fulfill. If that's right, then God has written you into his story because he has a specific purpose for you to fulfill in his story. Now, do you see how that idea is at odds with conformity? Because the more you become who someone else needs you to be, the less that you will be who God has made you to be. Do you understand that? The more you become who someone else needs you to be, the less you will become who God has made you to be. And what will happen is you will settle for a lesser story. You'll settle for a lesser story. Let me illustrate it this way. I've got two books on stage with me right now. The first one is just a compilation, a comp compilation of the Chronicles of Narnia. I got online and I just typed in top, top um, fiction books of all time. And Time Magazine produced a top 100 list. And within the top 10 was the Chronicles of Narnia. Now think about this series. If you haven't read it or, or seen the movies, then I'd encourage you to do so. But think about the main character in the story. You think about Aslan. He's the king of beasts. Amazing character. I want you to think about this. What if Aslan came to a point where he said, you know what, forget Narnia, forget Turkish delight. You know what I want to do? I want to jump stories and I want to be a character on one of the pages of the child's book, Opposites. I grabbed this book off of my six-month-old chair this morning, and I was like, yeah, that'll work. It's opposites. I've never heard of it before. It's a great book. It's squishy for kids. So I'm not knocking this book. If you're the author of this book in here, way to go. My kid loves it. Good job. Thanks for doing that. But I just want you to think about this. What if somehow Aslan, the king of beasts, was like, no, 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 no. Put me on the page that explains the opposites to infants. Like, I'll be on the page that explains the difference between slow and fast. How crazy would that be? That's so dumb. I mean, another book on the top 100 list was The Lord of the Rings. So just imagine the main character in The Lord of the Rings, Frodo Baggins. Frodo Baggins leaves the Shire and he sets out on this this ridiculous but amazing adventure to push back the darkness in the world and destroy this ring. What if Frodo Baggins came to a point where he was like, you know what, forget the Shire, forget Gandalf, forget the destroying the ring. I want a roll on the pages of opposites. Like, I want to be the key figure that helps infants understand the difference between closed and open. That's what I want my life to go to. Some of y'all are like, this illustration is so dumb. I agree. Be <laughs> because think about the point. That would never happen. Can't we agree that Aslan and Frodo would be settling for a lesser story? You have to understand when you conform, when you become who someone else needs you to be, you know what you're doing? You're settling for a lesser story written by a lousy author. 
And you are letting someone play God in your life who in fact is not God. If the God of the universe has cast you in the story of all of creation, then you might have to get to a point where you are okay not being enough for someone else's lesser and lousy story. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Do not spend a minute being someone other than who God has made you to be. Do not give anyone the power to play God who is in fact not God. The third key reality you need to know about conformity is this, and this is going to shock you. This is going to shock you. Okay? Because a good question after what we just said, that God has cast you in the story of all creation, if that's true, if he has a specific role for you to play in the story of all creation, then a good question to ask is, who has God made me to be and how has he handcrafted me to fit into his story? That's a good question to ask. Well, I'm going to answer that question for you. If you want to know the point and purpose of your life, if you want to know what God wants you to give your life to, just to be clear, the biggest waste of a life is to be extremely successful at doing the wrong thing. That's the biggest waste of a life. So if you want to step into the point and purpose of your life, if you want to know what God has made you to do, here it is. You want to know what God's made you to do? He's made you to conform. Wait, wait, wait. I thought the whole talk was about saying enough with conformity. I changed my mind. The three, third key reality you need to know is this. God has handcrafted you for the purpose of conformity. God has handcrafted you for the purpose of conformity. If you're confused, let me tell you what I'm getting at here. There is a bad type of conformity and there is a good type of conformity. See, conformity doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Sometimes it can be a God thing. It is actually God's will for you to conform. You know where I get that from? I get that from this book. Listen to what God tells us through Paul in Romans 8, 29. He says this, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Do you see what it's saying? Not all conformity is bad. We are saying enough with one kind of conformity. But there's a type of conformity that, a type of conformity that we must say yes to this morning. And it has everything to do with the point and purpose of our lives. God's plan for us, God's desire for us is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, what that means is you exist to look as much like Jesus as possible. You have breath in your lungs today so that you can know Jesus, enjoy Jesus, and show Jesus to the world. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of all of creation, just think, in Genesis 1-1, God said, the, the Bible starts with the words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we've barely gotten past the creation of day and night, sky and sea, plants and animals, and then we get the creation of the first human beings. And God declares the purpose of humanity in the first chapter of the entire Bible, Genesis 1.27 says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God created all of humanity in his image. What does that mean? It means that God made humanity to represent him and reflect him on the earth. That means that God wants to display his goodness, his kindness, his faithfulness, his gentleness, his, his grace, his forgiveness, his justice through humanity. That's why we exist, to make Jesus Christ look really good on the earth. Unfortunately, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and when they did, man, everything in this world was fractured, including the image of God within humanity. 
The image of God within humanity became broken. And so humanity was no longer able to accomplish the purpose for which it has been created. But God didn't abandon his plan for us. Instead, he sent a rescuer into the picture. That's Jesus Christ. Jesus shows up on the scene, and Paul tells us this about him in Colossians 1.15. He says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Do you see that? He's the image. He came and did what we couldn't do. He came to earth and perfectly represented and reflected God on the earth. And then he went to the cross. And the reason that he was crucified on a cross was so that he could deal with all of the ways that God's image in our lives have been broken. He was punished so that we wouldn't have to be. We don't deserve blessing from God. We deserve punishment for all of our imperfection. Jesus Christ took our place. He was buried in a tomb, and on the third day, he walked out of it, demonstrating that he had conquered sin and death, and he made a way for us to once again step into the purpose for which we have been created. Because when you open up your life to Jesus Christ, when through faith you don't just know about Jesus, but you truly know Jesus, and you receive him into your life as your Lord and Savior, he doesn't just save you from the penalty of your sin, but he saves you to a new life with new capabilities to once again represent and reflect God on the earth. That's why Paul explains in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says this, and we all with unveiled face, that's a reference to those who have seen Jesus for who he is, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Do you see that? God never abandoned his plan. He is transforming us by conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. So the reason that you exist is to put Jesus Christ on display to the rest of of the world. That is God's desire for you. So, if that's the case, then we have to be clear that there is a bad type of conformity and a good type of conformity, and our goal is to say enough with the bad type of conformity. And so let's just get really practical here. I need you to know that there are two significant differences between bad conformity and good conformity. The first is this. Bad conformity is all about becoming. Good conformity is all about surrendering. Let me explain what I mean. Bad conformity is all about becoming who someone else needs you to be in order for you to be enough. It is exhausting because you are having to be someone that you are not. That is bad conformity. It's all about becoming. Good conformity is different. It's all about surrendering. It's not about effort trying to be someone that you're not. It's all about surrendering and letting God make you into who he has actually designed you to be. It's surrendering to God's process and his design. It's surrendering to his process. I don't know if you just saw, but, but Paul said that this comes about by the work of the Spirit in our lives which is so encouraging because bad conformity is all about your effort. Good conformity is all about God's effort in you. It's all about his work in you through the Holy Spirit. It's about you coming to a place where you wake up every morning and just say, God, have your way in me. Mold and shape me into who you want me to be. Surrender to his process, but not just that, surrender to his design. When I say surrender to his design, what I'm saying is, is you come to a point where you say, God, I'm okay with how you made me. Can you say that this morning? Can you say, God, I'm okay with how you made me? Can you get to a place this morning where you really believe that God wants to display his glory in this earth through introverts as well as extroverts? God wants to display his glory through small people and big bone people. God wants to display his glory 
through high capacity people and medium and low capacity people. God wants to use everyone to display his glory. See, the bottom line is we spend so much of our time wishing that we were just a little bit less like ourselves and a little bit more like the people around us. But the reason that we want that is that we have the wrong end goal in mind. See, what we want is for people to uh, look at us and say, man, that person is awesome. But that's not what God celebrates. God doesn't celebrate greatness. He celebrates faithfulness. So our end goal is to cross the finish line of our lives and to hear those beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant. That's it. So can you get to a place this morning where you just say, God, you're the one who made me the way I am. If you wanted me to be like that person, I would have been like that person. If you would wanted a thousand of them, you would have made a thousand of them. But you made me. You made me unique. You made me with a purpose. God, I have weaknesses. Where I am weak, would you be strong? But you have your way in me today, whatever that looks like. Surrender to his design. The second big difference between bad conformity and good conformity is this. Bad conformity says conform for approval. Good conformity says conform from approval. Those are two totally different directions. You're either going to spend your life trying to get people's approval or you're going to spend your life living out of the approval that you already have. You know what the crazy thing is? The crazy thing is that we run out into the world begging people for the approval that we actually already have in Jesus Christ. Isn't that crazy? We beg people to accept us and approve of us when Jesus Christ got on a cross to declare, I want you. Makes me think about my boys. I've got three boys, Noah's eight, Andrew's six, Jake's six months old. Jake doesn't get it yet, okay? He doesn't understand. He's got a pass, he's six months old. But I've got this routine with my older boys where every day on the way to school, I drive them to school and when we're about a minute, 30 seconds away from the school, I say, hey Noah, I love you. I'm so proud you're my son. Hey, Andrew, I love you. I am so proud you're my son. And then at night, I give him a hug and I say, Noah, I love you. I'm so proud you're my son. Hey, Andrew, I love you. I'm so proud you're my son. And you know what their response is? Nothing. (laughs) They don't care. It means nothing to them. And part of me is like, when did they lose that wonder? When did it stop meaning something to them for their dad to say, I am full of pride at the fact that you're my child. There's nothing you could ever do that would make me stop loving you. At what point did their small little hearts grow callous to that reality? And it makes me think about us in this room and it makes me ask the question, when did we get to that point? When did we get to the point where it no longer mattered that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords says, I want you, I accept you, I approve of you. When did we lose that wonder with our heavenly father saying, I love you and I'm so proud that you're my son or my daughter? When did that happen? You're either going to spend your life chasing approval or you're going to spend your life resting in it. You have to decide. You can run out into the world and the reality is you might never be enough for people in this world. But you have a king who every day says, look at the cross. Because on that cross, I declared your worth. That you are valued at my body and my blood. I have declared that you are enough for me. Which begs the question, will that be enough for you? Let me just ask you to close your eyes real quick. 
And what I want to do is I just want to speak some words into your life, and I want to invite you to hear these words as if, as if the God of the universe is speaking them straight to you this morning. Would you just hear God saying these things to you? Would you just hear him say this morning, I love you so much, and I am proud that you are my son or my daughter. And if you're sitting there and you're like, man, this doesn't phase me or I can't believe that, you need to reject that in this, mo in this moment. You need to reject that as a lie and you need to lean in harder. Would you just hear God say to you, I made you because I want you. I died for you to be with you. Would you just hear him say, I, I delight in how I made you. I take pleasure in how I wired you. I enjoy using you to fulfill the unique role I made you to fulfill in the story of my creation. Would you just hear him say, you, you are enough for me because I've declared you to be enough. And would you just hear him say, I don't need you, but I want you. I want you for all of eternity. Lord Jesus, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you that you have come for us. I thank you that your cross tells us so much about how you feel about us. Your cross tells us that you want us. Your cross tells, you, tells us that you value us because you've placed value on us. Thank you that we are enough for you, not because of anything that we've done, but simply because you, Jesus, have done it all. Thank you that you've made a way for us. If there's anyone here this morning that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, may today be the day where you surrender your life to Jesus and invite him into your life to be your Savior and your Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, and you declare that we are enough for you. I pray that that would be enough for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, welcome to Postscript. My name is Michael Sullivan, business administrator here at FaithBridge, and I'm joined uh, by TA, Timothy Atik, who just brought us a great message on conformity. Thanks for being here, T.A. You bet. Thanks for having me. Well, we had a couple of questions come in this afternoon, so let's go ahead and get cracking on those. The first was uh, asking if you can suggest any good books for someone, especially a young adult, uh, that needs to work on conforming to be like Christ. So this person is drawing near to, looks like, high school graduation. Okay. They're seeking purpose in their life. Any good books to help them become more like Christ sure. that you'd suggest? Well, that's a, that's a really pivotal time in life. Mm -hmm. um, I'll encourage a few different books that aren't necessarily just about conforming to the image of Christ, but by reading them, they will encourage you to pursue Jesus in different areas of life, which mm -hmm. would lead to conforming to the image of sure. Christ. And so, uh, probably my favorite book of all time is called The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozier. It's just a book that will ignite your passion for Jesus, which mm. is great, and I encourage that. Um, a really practical book that I think deals a lot with just becoming more like Jesus is a book called Crazy Love by Francis mm -hmm. Chan. Um, there's also a book called Radical by David Platt. Both of those will give a lot of um, a lot of motivation towards becoming more and more like Jesus. Um, zeroing in on some specific issues, in particular um, dating and romantic relationships, which stepping into college becomes such a huge component mm -hmm. of students' lives. Mm -hmm. I would highly encourage Ben Stewart's book, Single, Dating, Engaged, Married. It's probably 
in my opinion, the best resource out on the market right now, especially for college students mm -hmm. in that area. Um, and then particularly on the area of just needing people's approval, which we established today, conformity feeds on the need for approval. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's two books, um, The Search for Significance, which I forgot the author's name at this moment, and then there's a book called Glory Hunger hmm. by a guy named J.R. Vassar. Both of those might be helpful yeah. in that area. Well, there you go. Lots of resources they can yeah. dig into and check out uh, to move along there and becoming more like yeah. Christ. Uh, the second question that came in is, you talked about that first point just a second ago, that conformity feeds on a need for approval. And you asked two really good questions. You said, whose blessing uh, do you want or need? And then who do you become when you're seeking that blessing? And kind of the question that came in was, you know, uh, you listed out sometimes that person you're seeking from approval could be a parent or a spouse or a boss. And these are people that you're in close proximity to. So you can't really... You know, sometimes the Bible would say if you're being caused to sin to flee. Well, sure. in this case, yeah, that's can't really flee do. my spouse. Yeah. So practically, do you have anything to help us address this for these people who are in close proximity to us in terms yeah. of, you know, not seeking their approval? Yeah, I would say that, you know, there's a difference, especially in marriage, there has to be a difference between conforming and compromising. Compromising has to be a part of every marriage where where two people are saying, you know what, there are ways that I need to change in order to be better for, for my marriage. Mm. And that's a healthy thing to say like, you know what, we are both sinful people, we are both stubborn and selfish people because we are human beings, mm -hmm. which is going to require me to change. And Jesus is constantly changing us to be more like him. And so part of that will be compromising in our marriage and not just doing it for the other person's approval, but so that God will be glorified through your marriage. Mm -hmm. Now, if you find yourself in an unhealthy situation where you feel like your spouse is, is stubborn and unwavering and is, is demanding that you perform a certain way mm -hmm. to meet his or her needs, then then that's when I would encourage marriage counseling, honestly, mm -hmm. to get a third party agent in the mix that can say, look, compromise is a part of every marriage mm -hmm. and it is healthy for you to look at other people's, each other's needs and say, hey, how can I flex to be more accommodating mm -hmm. so that our relationship is more healthy? But there are unhealthy times where where you need a third party speaking in just saying, look, the, this type of change is not, is not healthy. Mm -hmm. That's specifically for marriage. And the same goes with a parent-child relationship where there is that compromise. You know, parents are going to lean towards control and uh, kids are going to lean towards not wanting to be controlled. And so there comes that compromise mm -hmm. of as a child gets older, and enters adulthood, you know, sometimes the problems are more when kids are become adults mm -hmm. and parents don't want to let go of that yeah. control. And there needs to be that understanding that as they get older, there's that relinquishing of control. And, and as you get older, there's just that growing respect and, and honor for, for your parent. Mm -hmm. In the, in the, in the working world, it's that fine line of like, you're hired to do a specific job, and so you want to always pursue getting better at your craft. Mm -hmm. That's a part of glory, honoring the Lord, mm -hmm. is pursuing, the lo pursuing your work with excellence in order to honor the Lord. Mm -hmm. But there might be times where, you know, your boss or your coworkers are, are wanting you to, you know, compromise your standards or convictions. That, that has to be off the table. Mm -hmm. And then there might just be that internal drive to say, I want to do this because I need my boss's approval. I need mm -hmm. this person to always, you know, affirm me. And that's, that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. you, you have to work away from that mm -hmm. to say, you know what, I'm ultimately working for the Lord. The, the Bible says to do your work as doing it for the Lord and not mm -hmm. for man. Mm -hmm. And that speaks 
to the workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Well, those all three of those are helpful. I was thinking about particularly that marriage piece. And if, if you're out there and you need a resource, uh, Dan Slagle, Beth Ellis here at FaithBridge can reference you to a counselor or even possibly provide counseling from them if that's of use to you. So it's thanks great. for that. Um, and thanks for being here. We always enjoy having you yeah. here. It was a great two-part series. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for listening in to Postscript. We'll be back next week. It will be Easter Sunday. So we'll recap uh, our Life Begins Easter message. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.